Riley was horrified. He could feel his bones shake, his muscles twitch. It isn't until you're staring down 90 pounds of flesh-tearing predator that you realize you're just a bag of fever and pretty skin. He was no longer present. Instead, the reptilian part of his brain took over. Hands out and flat palms facing the snarling beast, Riley said, Hey, buddy. We're looking for a friend. Can we be friends? Was this a stupid idea? Riley thought so. Jacob had no opinion. Other than releasing what little was left in his bladder, Jacob was already dead. He was just waiting for his body to get the memo. Jacob watched, although not taking much in, as Riley tried to reason with the beast. Riley looked behind him and pointed. This is my best friend Jacob. Dude, don't tell him my name. Riley looked back to talk to Jacob. It was that moment the dog lunged, snapping his jaws in the air. As the dog flew through the air, time stopped. The boys watched as 90 pounds of flesh-tearing anger leapt in their direction without hesitation. Riley closed his eyes. There was nothing left to do but accept fate. In his last moments, he remembered Patches. His cute little pink nose, the little pitter-patter of his paws on the hardwood floor, the late-night cuddle sessions on a cold winter days. If this was how things ended, if Riley had to die looking for his best friend, it was a life well lived. As these thoughts passed, he noticed it was taking longer than anticipated to die. More curious than fearful, Riley opened his eyes. To his surprise, a man in steel toe boots, oil-covered blue overalls, and a dirty undershirt stood in front of him, and his cracked, calloused hands held on to the dog's carlin. Grime and dirt under his nails indicated he must work here. His bald head, scarce of hair, now mostly replaced by a thick layer of grime, was confirmation of his job, as much as his lack of teeth. What you boys doing here? He asked in a gravelly voice. Uh, excuse me, sir, I, I apologize. We got lost. The man slapped his dog's butt and yelled, Go on, get! The dog slowly sauntered away. The man turned his attention back to the boys. I ain't got no time for your bullshit. What you boys doing here? You want to shine friends? The boys looked at each other. Uh, yeah, yeah, we go to school with Sean, Riley said. It wasn't a lie. Maybe they weren't friends, but they did go to school together. How many times I got to tell that some bitch not to bring his friends round? The man let out a long-drawn sigh and wiped his greasy head. Grime from his fingers left a large black streak on his sweaty head. I'll show you out. Now don't you be coming back, yeah? I can't be no responsible if what happens. The man turned around to look at the dog laying in her doghouse. I can't be responsible if, uh, well, Bertha here might do. She's a wild one. He turned back to her again. Ain't that right, baby? The dog half stood for a moment. All right, now, don't get yourself crazy now. The dog sat down in disappointment. The boys have seen enough. If they never came back here, that was too soon. The man escorted them through the gate. The sun was starting to set, creating a sky that had the weight and color of creamy coffee. The boys walked around the fence to where they left their bikes and headed back to Jacob's for dinner. The sun was starting to dim in the summer sky. As they came up to Beaker Street, Riley stopped and said, I know a shortcut. His eyes lit up with excitement. When my dad took me to the planetarium, he showed me this way. Says he used to cross this alley all the time as a kid. Jacob shrugged and followed suit. The alleyway was guarded by two large green garbage bins. The air in the alley was thick and resembled a sweet combination of decay and vinegar. Graffiti painted the walls in dirty limericks that Riley tried to read as he passed. There once was a woman named Jill who swallowed an exploding pill. They found her vagina in North Carolina and... The rest was written over. As the boys approached the end of the alley, light shone through like a crack in a mine. A North Star guided the boys back to civilization. As the light grew, the city opened up. The smell of decay began to fade as exhaust and the smell of city living took hold again. Uh, Rye? Jacob said with concern in his voice. What? Jacob pointed down, and much like his mental state, his tire was also deflated. Riley stepped off his bike, as if a closer inspection may patch the hole. Riley looked up at Jacob, who was looking down at him, hoping for a solution. To Jacob's disappointment, Riley said, Think we can make it back to my place? The boys made their way back to Riley's. 
Riley pedaled just fast enough to maintain balance, while Jacob wobbled gently as he rode, trying to maintain the integrity of the flat tire. Have you ever done this before? asked Jacob. Yeah. Well, no, not really, but my dad did. Like, I've watched him a gazillion times. Okay. The okay didn't sound too confident, but if his tire could hold on, so could his hope. When the boys arrived at Riley's house, his dad's car sat in the driveway. He knew for certain his dad was home. Worst case, he could just ask his dad to fix the tire, but hoped he wouldn't have to. The boys parked their bikes on the front lawn. Riley turned to Jacob and said, I'll be right back. Jacob nodded. As Riley headed towards the house, Jacob asked, Aren't you going to take my bike? My dad's working. I'll quietly grab the tools. Jacob nodded. The house was eerily quiet. Without Riley's mother singing in the kitchen or his little brother crying, the house felt more like four walls and a roof than a home. Two more days, he thought to himself. Riley never realized how much he missed them until he stepped into an empty house. Riley could hear faint muffles coming from the door leading to the garage. Normally, the door is closed and locked, but with the house to himself, Dad is free to clutter every flat surface with his boring blueprints and legal contracts. Riley imagined what his dad could be working on. Numbers lined the walls with blueprints and designs. Conversations with contractors, city planners, and engineers. He didn't understand much, but he knew his dad was important, and that was enough for Riley. As he made his way to the door, the muffled noises became louder. It almost sounded like singing. Riley quietly peeked through the crack to see what his dad was up to, not to interrupt him mid-conversation. Riley's father was dancing around his, quote-unquote, office. The walls were lined with red paint, scribbles, and letters that Riley didn't recognize. Clothes lines lined the walls with corpses of skins from what appeared to be animals. Riley suddenly put names to the corpses. The great tabby was short hair and the corner was cupcake. The large black cat hung by the garage door, its innards still fresh and shiny was Buster, Miss Melanie's cat. There were cats everywhere. The smell made him want to vomit, but fear kept it down. Riley's father wasn't in his traditional three-piece suit, but instead was as naked as the day he was born, and instead of silk, blood covered his body, again with symbols Riley didn't understand. His eyes were two dinner plates. The whites of his eyes were eclipsed by giant pupils. Riley couldn't believe his eyes, for on his father's head was an orange tabby, gutted and left empty like a pillowcase. The corpse hung on his head like a hat. Front paws hung by his eyes as the tail made for a makeshift ponytail. The blood from the skin dripped on his face and back, painting him in blood. Worst of all, the name tag glimmered in the neon light. The blood filled in the carved-in grooves of the tag, and blood read the tag read, Hello, I'm Patches. His dad didn't notice him. He was transfixed by his ritual, dancing around, singing in a throaty voice, releasing noises Riley never imagined a human could make. As he danced in the skin, innards in hand, he sang, I ho, sing, sing, all hail the cat king. Riley ran out of the house. The fresh air made no difference. The world he knew would never be the same. Riley was no longer a kid, and soon, Jacob wouldn't be either. Since Riley could remember, he wanted to be a detective. He wanted to solve mysteries. But as he learned today, some mysteries are better left unsolved. The End Patient ID 3111 Name Chaos Case File The Cat King In our world, those cats meant a great deal to those people. Not as much as you may think, Doctor. You humans are benighted at the best of times. Your capacity for love only exists as far as its convenience. Humans are complicated. While they may lack the omniscience capability such as yourself, might that be the value of what makes them human? I create and destroy an infinity of universes in the time it takes a human to blink. My power is beyond your comprehension. But what is a few lives in the grand scheme? To them, those few lives are their universe.